a lot of wrestling have really crazy descriptions for the name, so they're not things you can, you know, immediately understand. And the more exotic sounding the hold, the more dangerous it must be. Crossbar toe hold, the kingpin. How are you going to get out of the Indian death lock or the Japanese leg lock? So this uh, diagram called the Tell You Vision is basically helping to tell people what the holds actually look like that are being applied by the wrestlers. And this is uh, before people had televisions. So over the airwaves at night, and you'd have orchestra music, followed by the wrestling <laughs> matches from Wellington. A lot of these moves came out of amateur wrestling and were based in real moves. They just gave them more exotic names. They added to the drama. Oh no, he's stuck in the octopus clamp. How will they get out? Okay, right in front of me now we have a scrapbook that pertains to Muhammad Ali's visit to New Zealand in February 1979, which uh, got a lot of press. Muhammad Ali was a big name, not just to people that liked boxing. Him coming to New Zealand was a really big deal. So we see here there's everything from Muhammad Ali's on his way, his first interviews, and every little quote they can get from him they turn into a, an article. He's on the front page of the Herald. He's used in advertising here for Air New Zealand. The front cover of the Women's Weekly, make sure you buy it. An advert here, South Pacific Television. Ali says, we are the cleanest. You know how much New Zealanders like to hear some credit from another country that we've done something well. But great crowd work for Muhammad Ali who's walking around Queen Street. This is quite hilarious. He drew on the tablecloth at the celebrity function. They auctioned off something like this tablecloth, flipping it. Now we go, oh yeah, of course, that's worth money. But at the time, people were like, it's, it's not news. That's what makes Dave's collection so good, is that if you, were, if you have something you're trying to research or look up or learn about, that you get a very comprehensive view of it in any of these scrapbooks. Dave Cameron collection uh, encompasses boxing and wrestling from the 20th century. The earliest scrapbooks we have, this is 1951, so he's already decided as a teenager that he's going to make a new scrapbook for each year. This one's a wrestling one. He's using a school book. He clips out the the advertisements in the, in the newspaper, photos of the people, the wrestlers involved, and then he's, rather than clip out the results, he's written them in by hand. It might have been that a lot of these matches he was in attendance for, or he listened to them on the radio. Dave's told many stories of his mum telling him to go to sleep and waiting till she goes to sleep and then turning the radio back on. <laughs> so he was born in 1933. His father was a pastor. He had a big family. And they moved around often in the Hawke's Bay region. Uh, and when he was a teenager, they sort of settled in that area. And that's when he really got interested in sport. What was interesting about professional wrestling matches and the boxing was that you'd have your main events, but then the underneath of the show would be filled up with local amateurs. So Dave got on those shows. I really like this photo here because it shows Dave in context. This is when he was in the Air Force. He was stationed in Whanuapai there, and that's when he did some boxing in the uh, New Zealand Services Championships and also did some wrestling. And because he had done it, then the other boxers and wrestlers, I think, respected him more than just your average fan. Dave's someone who took his interest to unusual lengths, like he was willing to send, you know, self-addressed uh, stamped envelopes around the world asking, you know, the former world heavyweight champion boxer, can you please send me a signed uh, photograph? And he eventually get something back. So here we have a signed photo of Floyd Patterson, world heavyweight champion in 1957. Dave has it, actually. <laughs> this is a boxer, Terry Allen, the world flyweight champion from England. Dave's got a signed photo there in 1950. You got Freddie Mills, quite famous. He was involved in movies and in crime as well. It's a very, very extensive autograph collection. Here we have Boz Murphy, who was one of the top stars in the 1950s, and he had a lot of outdoor boxing events signed to Dave from Boz Murphy, which is really cool. And Dave was actually in attendance at some of these fights. Vic Patrick, Boz Murphy outside. Then Dave was at this fight, and you can see how many people were there. That was in Wellington. In those days, wrestling was presented here in New Zealand. It was presented as that it was legitimate. 
if the crowd tried to get involved because they were upset at what had happened at the end of the wrestling match, the police would come into the arena and if there was a disqualification and they would take one of the wrestlers away. The police thought it was real too, so you can find some good clippings in the scrapbooks about that. Here we have uh, Dave Cameron's scrapbook for 1990, uh, and it says New Zealand cuttings for wrestling. It's got Hulk Hogan on the front, very iconic wrestler of that time. So this is sort of a really peak era for people of a certain age because this is when wrestling was on TV too here, superstars of wrestling. So when we go inside, we have the Bushwhackers here who are from New Zealand. Right here we have a, a clipping about the warehouse being asked not to sell the wrestling toys anymore, um, but they said they're gonna keep doing it. Wrestling's getting so big that we're starting to see wrestling shows appear here. So we're starting to get like the British Bulldogs, Don Morocco, these American wrestlers that kids have seen on TV, and now they're appearing in New Zealand. Uh, here we have TV3 starting up their show called The Main Event. Rather than buy another wrestling show from America, they decided to make their own one, which didn't go so well. So wrestling, it started becoming cool again at school. Then I was thinking, man, I didn't watch it for like four or five years. I wonder what happened. Before the internet, they didn't want to tell you what had happened because they might, you know, make up some story about it. So I started reading magazines and then I saw in one of the magazines, it's, it had a list of people you could contact for if you wanted wrestling, buy old magazines or photos or whatever you were interested in. But there was a guy there from New Zealand. So I just wrote to him being like, oh, I'm interested in knowing about this something. I can't even remember what it was now, but that was the first time I went to the room that Dave's uh, wrestling and boxing room. Yeah, so I've been friends ever since. Okay, we're looking at uh, Dave Cameron's scrapbook on the Bushwhackers. They were popular in the WWF, which is in North America, so they were shown all around the world and they wrestled all around the world. But they are two guys from the Wellington area in New Zealand. The scrapbook tracks their career because by the time they became the Bushwhackers, they'd actually been wrestling for a very long time. They actually started in New Zealand in the 1960s. So here we've got some photos that Dave took himself. Clean shaven beard, he captured all their looks, all the different outfits they wore over the years. And here later on when they came to New Zealand to wrestle on a tour. So here's Dave with Luke. This is an example of uh, one of the posters that the library has in Dave Cameron's collection. So here we have John De Silva, former uh, Empire Games wrestler and Olympic wrestler. He's clad in a lot of authentic Maori clothing there. Dave is great friends with uh, John De Silva, and he's wrestling in Brighton here against the Greek wrestler Johnny Costas. This is from the period of time where Dave uh, lived in England. Uh, we're looking at a photograph album from 2016 uh, sort of time frame. Probably the whole 21st century that Dave kept scrapbooking and photograph element. He was mostly interested in boxing. He took a great interest in a couple of young boxers that were getting very popular at that time, Shane Cameron and Joseph Parker. We got a nice photo of Dave here with Joseph Parker and Ian Law. Basically, if you want to track Joseph's career from about 11 years old, you can do that in Dave's collection. Dave was going to the gyms, going to the events, taking photos. He was friends with them. So there's a lot of candid shots here, shots that you won't see from the press. This is a pack of figurines of The Rock called Dwayne Johnson. This is an example of where he was sort of transitioning between wrestling and the movie. So they weren't quite sure on this example of how they should sell it. So I guess so they were like, well, we'll make one of each, a Scorpion King character and The Rock character. The collection doesn't contain a lot of these wrestling goals. It used to, Dave had hundreds of them, but they were all sold off. But uh, it was important for the library to keep some as an example, but uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, he actually lived here in New Zealand as a young child because his father and his grandfather were both wrestling here. So The Rock's got quite good ties to New Zealand. We're looking at a 1972 wrestling clipping scrapbook. That was a good year for wrestling in New Zealand, but what makes it really, really interesting is because of this man that's on the cover here, Andre the Giant, as everyone knows him. In 1972, he was actually called Jean Ferry. But what was interesting was that was the first year that he visited New Zealand. So, you know, people were very interested in Jean Ferry and he stopped traffic and stopped people in the shops. And you can see here, Giant Jean Ferry. So he wasn't called Andre the Giant at that time. It was also the first year, 1972, of women's wrestling in New Zealand. So it's a doubly interesting album, this one. So there was always been a point where 
what to do with Dave's collection. Lots of people came to visit it, so it was obviously interesting to people. It was pretty good when Dave said that he'd been talking to the library about donating it. I went out and visited Dave and Shirley at their house in Birkenhead. It would be about four or five years ago now. And that was my first introduction to the collection itself. So Dave took me through a little doorway and it was honestly, it was like walking into Aladdin's cave. It was just amazing. Once I got over the initial shock of how are we going to even deal with something this size? I could step away a bit and start formulating a bit of a plan about how we might tackle it. In the end, we only had a, a week's notice to bring the collection in because it was a working collection up until that point. But then uh, when he and Shirley moved into a retirement village, the house had to be sold. And we spent a week on site just sorting and boxing, working out what we would take and what we wouldn't take. Once we got all the books on and scrapbooks onto our shelves downstairs, we had 55 shelves. So it's one of the bigger collections that we have downstairs. There are a couple of ways the public can use the collection and access it. The quickest way will probably be to go to our Kura website and just do a search on the Dave Cameron collection. If you're looking for particular boxes, for instance, if it's a family member or it's a, a sportsman that you're interested in, then you can search on that name. But for people who are just generally curious about the collection, they can just come to our reading room and ask to see it. Special collections here at the Central Library is part of Auckland Library's heritage collections. Our focus has really shifted a lot more strongly to contemporary collecting in the, the last 10, 15 years or so. And it's important that our collecting reflects our communities, our wider Auckland community as it changes over time. And so to get a sports collection like this one that represents the historical collecting of one person but that encompasses the history of those two sports, that's really useful for researchers. But it's also a really interesting reflection on the place of sports and the development of New Zealand's culture over time. We collect now for people in the future who want to know what we were interested in and how we lived and what our communities did.